Mildred's Journal, December 1st, 2014, Southside Haven, 42nd Street. Everyone's huddled up in their own holes or parts of holes after the cold snap that took place last week. Snowplows scrambling to clear the road so people can work. It's a humbling thought that as much as humanity can predict nature, we still can only react when the chips are down. HPD found a body frozen outside the river today. It looks like someone saw an opportunity to make their move while the weather kept the city immobile. Triad guy, it looks like. Suppose he probably bit off more than he could chew trying to muscle into one of the family's business. I'm sure they'll have an autopsy soon, but all it'll do is confirm what everybody knows by now. It's been four years and three months since I left the force for the private sector, and in those years I've seen the ugly side of the city that even the oldest of hats don't talk about. More and more I get the feeling that something's gonna snap, and when it does, everyone's gonna be scrambling for their little peace of mind, and damn even family and friends in the process. I just hope I can live long enough to witness Haven becoming hell when it comes. Developed and published by Lewis Porter Jr., Haven City of Violence is self-described as a cross between Sin City, Hard Boiled, and The Crow. Running at just shy of 200 pages long, essentially aiming for dark neo-noir in a contemporary setting. Coming out in the early 2000s as it did, there had been some unfortunate comparison to D20 Modern, implying that it's a poor man's version of such in, in some reviews that I had seen. I'll get to where I stand on that at the end of the review. Most of the book is in black and white, with a short color comic at the start best called A Day in the Life of Haven, which seems to be a mix of John Woo cinema and Ashley Wood's use of watercolor. After that, the book opens with a foreword explaining what the book is and the proper audience for it. Likely in the wake of how games have been the go-to target to blame for the last 40 years, Lewis Porter Jr. goes on a minor rant about how everyone is responsible for their own actions, lamenting at the necessity that such a statement is even needed to be in the book. I wholeheartedly agree, though nowadays it seems like the arguments in the blame game have taken a more annoying term in the last couple years. That aside, the first chapter delves into the city of Haven itself which seems to be more like a Detroit or a Chicago analog than the typical New York one we see in contemporary RPGs. Even so, it's a city that has the legitimate and barely legitimate affairs all over, with things skewed more towards faction warfare than white-collar crime. Much like a Grand Theft Auto-style game, every major form of criminal organization exists here in one way or another. Also, near the end of the chapter is a set of inserts that present a brief introduction to each faction and a sample set of stats on a typical character within it. In Chapter 2, the game delves into character creation. While the first few pages give a set of example archetype builds, much like the faction builds from the last chapter, I will instead focus on the creation system itself. All starting characters begin with a pool of 100 character points to spend on primary abilities, skills, benefits, drawbacks, and special abilities. Primary abilities are your main attributes in the game, as well as the determining factor in secondary attributes. Strength, Will, Agility, Stamina, Intelligence, and Perception are these. Each one of these must have at least one point allocated to it and may be spent on a one-to-one -one basis, with 9 to 15 being the range of average ability for characters in Haven. Secondary abilities aren't used on points, but are rather calculated by the average of two primary abilities. Set abilities are as follows. Influence, Movement Value, Accuracy, Fighting Value, Subterfuge, Countermeasure, and finally, concussive and lethal health. Skills are more preset than abilities, to a certain degree. A character's intelligence rating divided by 3 determines the number of skill picks they have available. These skills grant a plus 1 modifier to their rolls by default, but can be increased to plus 4 by spending 1, 2, or 3 character points. The exception to this rule is language. A character's rating for their na native language is 10, plus the result of a d10 roll. Depending on the character's intelligence, they may have more than one language, each at a rating of 5 plus d10. Benefits and drawbacks are a collection of advantages and disadvantages, which may add or subtract from their overall ability. As such, they have a varied cost or gain in CP, respectively, with some being available to be taken multiple times. Special abilities are similar to benefits, but have a more unique flavor to them and are implied to be a quasi-supernatural effect akin to Sixth Senses. After distributing these points, the final step is to acquire his or her starting equipment, which you will have $1,000 to spend on. Note that certain items may be vetoed by the GM if deemed inappropriate for the character and or campaign. 
Chapter 3 covers abilities, specifically the die mechanics on using one's base ability scores and the uses of said abilities in play. The primary rolling mechanic in Haven is a roll under d20, with the target number being an ability plus or minus the appropriate modifiers from skills, difficulty, and situation. The remainder of the chapter covers special rules for each attribute, as well as the experience point cost for advancing abilities or skills, ending with a selection of equipment available to the character, which will be expanded upon later. Chapter 4 is all about the way combat works. The only straightforward parts in combat are initiative, which is determined by agility, and ranged combat, which works standard fare for contemporary RPGs. The main difference is that there is no attack versus defense calculation. Success or failure is determined solely by a character's accuracy roll. Upon a hit, a d10 roll is used to determine hit location and subsequent damage. It is in hand-to-hand -hand combat and driving that things are a bit more intricate. In hand-to-hand, -hand, each type of attack has a set of offensive maneuvers versus a universal set of defensive maneuvers. Offensive ones are categorized by the type of strike first and the aimed target second, these special actions like a DDT being the exception to this rule with a number of available maneuvers per turn for each round equal to one's fighting value, though some actions like clinch cost more than one point of FV to use in combat. Regardless of action, both the attacker and defender choose a maneuver as appropriate and reveal them simultaneously, after which the combat chart is consulted to determine the damage, if any. As a final note, the damage die utilized on a successful hit is determined by the attacker's strength ability. I do like this system, but I think the game would be better served by putting this on cards. Which is exactly what I would do in my campaigns for this, similar to the Pursuit cards in Spycraft 2.0. Although the actions used are different, driving combat works similarly to hand-to-hand -to -hand combat in terms of mechanics. The primary difference is the maneuvers available and the fact that agility determines the available actions instead of FV. That said, this only considers driving maneuvers. Shooting while in driving combat works as normal, albeit dealing damage to vehicle as body, instead of the usual hit locations. Chapter 5 delves into what the game calls the Golden Rules. In truth, this is the main GM section of the book, and much of the advice is standard fare for a GM advice section in an RPG, but it puts extra emphasis on the best courses of action to give your game the gritty feel that Haven is going for, emphasizing that it is not good versus evil, but evil versus evil in a manner of speaking. Chapter 6, the final chapter in this book, is a sample adventure called Emerald Hill, written by Hero System alumni Stephen S. Long. In an interesting twist, the player characters aren't pulling off a heist or hit for a faction, but rather are pursuing a group that pulled a similar feat which has irritated the factions in Haven, with the player characters pursuing the group for information before the factions kill them in some way. That said, the adventure quickly takes a turn for later acts, and is quite detailed in terms of setting and major characters. As I said at the start of this review, Haven had gotten the unfortunate reputation as a poor man's D20 modern, largely due to coming out shortly after it did. Personally, I think the comparison is superficial since it uses a roll under D20 instead of roll over, and any comparison via setting is equally baseless. Furthermore, Haven is meant for the lower-key, realism-centric style of play with little in the way of the fantastic, something that cannot be said about D20 Modern. All that said, Haven does the John Woo Sin City vibe very well, and presents a very unique system for melee combat as well as chase sequences, which are usually relegated to a series of skill rolls. However, Haven is not without problems. First and foremost, I have to dock points for Haven for not including an index or a blank character sheet in the copy I own. Both are essential in a core book for a role-playing game, especially if you're going to be frequently looking up tables in play. And I don't think mine is some bootleg, this is the retail version that I bought. In addition, Haven uses a point-buy system, and as a result requires additional supervision from the GM to make sure the players don't min-max or game the system to get the maximum benefits. While having a few stat blocks help matters, it's not by much. Finally, the game lacks a unified rogues gallery for encounters, something to help modify the standard stat blocks effectively for new players. Haven is by no means the worst contemporary RPG I've come across, but it's not quite top tier either. It's in a middle ground, a bit more crunchy than games like the Gumshoe Engine, but not quite as toolkit as, as Spycraft 2.0. Still, there's some good ideas here, and I can definitely recommend it to those looking to mix neo-noir crime drama in their role-playing. Overall, I give Haven City of Violence a 7 out of 10.